Okrima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai, veteran journalist and broadcaster Beverly Ross Muller, joins me to unpack her book titled Hunting the Seven, How the Kukuluti Seven Assassins Were Exposed. Welcome, Beverly. So your book tells the story of the Kukuluti Seven and the hunt for the truth of their deaths. So can you tell us more about what transpired on March 3rd, 1986, which led to the deaths of seven young African men? Yes, I'm uh, very willing to do that. It's not really the story of the Google Letter 7, because the book begins with their deaths. So the story is really how they were killed, who killed them, the white assassins who killed them, and the reporters who um, covered it, and then, and then what happened after that. So of course, they are the people who were killed. Um, I don't think I would have been qualified to write a book about the Google Letter 7 themselves, but I, as with my background of both a historian, an academic, and a journalist. I was connected to the story from very early on. And so after nearly 40 years, I thought, well, if I don't write the story about what actually happened, it's going to get lost. So what happened was that on March the 3rd, 1986, a very strange event took place on the outskirts of Gugaletu, just as you drive into it. Um, there are two big hostels on either side of an open felt, which is now built up at, at the time was open. And at 20 past seven in the morning, quite early, when everybody in Google had either gone to work or gone to school, it was a very quiet time. Suddenly, out of the blue, there was an enormous sound, like a car crashing, one of the witnesses said afterwards. And for eight minutes, there was the most tremendous sound of bullets, automatic gunfire, rifle shots that just went on and on for a full eight minutes. And then suddenly it stopped completely and there was dead silence. And obviously everyone with an earshot was tremendously shocked at, at this noise. It sounded like a war. And at the end of that, seven young black men lay dead, four at the intersection going into Gugaletu next to two white vans, which later become very important in the story. And one lying in the felt in uh, at three had tried to run towards the bushes, the Port Jackson bushes. One had been shot dead in front of one of the hospitals and two more were shot under very mysterious circumstances within the bush itself. And what happened was that almost immediately after that, a story was sent out by the police to the news services, all of which were in state control at that stage, saying that they had bravely shot dead seven terrorists or communists or ANC members or, you know, you, the mix was always, you know, the same. And they all meant the same thing. And that they had um, they had foiled an ambush where they were, they were trying to kill policemen. Um, and many of them, in fact, were later decorated for what had happened. And the problem was that the entire story was a lie from the beginning. And can you tell us about the process you undertook to put in this book together? How were you able to get the research needed? And what processes you used to interview your sources? Oh, okay. So luckily, I mean, I started life as a journalist. I was a very young reporter, very young, 17, uh, on the Cape Argus here in Cape Town. So I had years and years of interviewing skills. But then I went to university and I did academic work and a PhD. And, and so I had a very strong research background. But I think perhaps the most important thing for me was that I had a very personal connection to the case. Right from the beginning, I was an anti-apartheid activist, and along with Tian van der Merwe, who was the then anti-apartheid member of parliament for Greenpoint, we worked together quite a lot in the townships uh, when the civics called us in. And so I met the mothers, I met the families immediately after it had happened. I saw them in their grief their lack of understanding about what had happened because they knew their sons were activists. I helped organize the funerals. And um, if you read the book, you will see, you know, that was an incredibly terrifying experience, as all funerals were in those days in the in the townships. And I also attended the, the TRC hearings and some of the amnesty hearings. I'd gone to Lusaka in 89. I was a visitor to Robben Island political prisoners. But I think that the, this story really stuck with me because of the grief of the mothers. One day, seven mothers said goodbye to their sons and they never came home. And 
they never found out what happened to them and they couldn't get any justice for them. And that has just sat on my chest for all of these years. And I thought, thought well, if nobody else is going to write the story at this point, if I don't write it, it's going to be lost forever. And can you tell us about the two inquests which followed the deaths of the men in a dramatic trial in 1987? In those days, uh, the magistrates who were appointed to the courts were what was known as safe magistrates. No policeman was ever charged for uh, human rights violations in the course of their duty in this whole period, right throughout the 80s. You know, if they went in and people were shot all over the place and it ever went to court, which it hardly ever did, mostly they were not prosecuted, um, they were simply never found guilty. And I think one of the most important parts of the story was that the two reporters, Chris Bateman, who, who covered the story and was the first person to realize that the story was not what it seemed to be, and Tony Weaver, who came in the story as well the next day, were both charged for what they had reported, which was in fact turned out to be the truth. But the courts were so confident of the story that the police had put out that it couldn't be challenged under the Police Act that the two inquests which were held in Weinberg Magistrate Court, one later the same year and then one two years after Tony Weaver's trial, both under the same magistrate, Mr Hoffman, both found that the police were completely innocent of all wrongdoing and that they had been killed in self-defence. The inquests were held in Afrikaans. There were no translations, so the mothers couldn't understand anything that was said. And the magistrate just refused to hear any other evidence other than the police. He said he, he was not interested in, in hearing anything else. So the problem is that to this day, right now, as I'm speaking to you now, those inquests still stand. And I have been in touch with Demis and Cerveza, who was, of course, at the TRC, saying that those inquests need to be overturned now by the MPA. Also, Beverly, what role did the Truth and Reconciliation play in ensuring that the inhumanity of apartheid was exposed and recorded? Certainly, if this case had never been accepted by the TRC, we would never have found out what had really happened because it was taken on, mainly because of the trial of Tony Weaver, a lot of evidence came out because of his brilliant legal team, that the police had tried to hide. They had destroyed all the ballistics. They believed that they would never be what they had actually done, which was deliberately assassinate seven innocent young men who were not, not even activists. And that was believed for 10 years. And then when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up in the, the beginning, started in the beginning of 1996, uh, three of the mothers went to visit Mary Burton, who was one of the commissioners and who had been at the funerals, uh, including along, I had seen her there. Um, we had we had been together at the second funeral. And they said to her, we want justice for our sons. And she was so impressed with them and their story that the TRC decided to take it on as what they called a gateway case. And that was that if they could crack the story open, and there was a lot of evidence that came out of the Tony Weaver trial that helped them, that they could then maybe find out what the police had really done. And, and that's what happened. And it was during the second hearing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I remember being in the room and those mothers had to sit right next to the killer policeman, remember, it was a, it was a terribly emotional experience. For the first time, we discovered that it had been a flat plus operation organized by the death farm that operated uh, near Gauteng. And I discovered during the course of my research in this book, just last year, that it was the only time that flat plus ever came to Cape Town. And I started wondering why. Why would they only come to Cape Town once? What was the reason that lay behind that? And while reading your book, I saw that you say people do not know much about the history of the seven Googlets. So what do you think ought to be done to honor or celebrate those men that died on that fateful day? I, I think what should be done for all of the people who were killed, or I mean, not only the Googlet seven, and they were really innocent victims, but what about the Kragadok four? What about the Pepco three? I mean, they're 
There are thousands of victims of human rights violations who were killed in South Africa. And some of them have memorials to them, and there is a memorial in, in Google 80 to the Google 87. It's not entirely accurate because at the time it was, it's, it's a beautiful memorial, actually not in very good condition, but I believe it's being renovated. And it portrays them as sort of liberation heroes when in fact they were, they were victims. Nevertheless, they died because of apartheid. So their deaths have no less meaning in terms of apartheid than anyone else's. I'm a little hesitant to say that memorials and monuments really tell the story because when I was there earlier this year, I went to see the only surviving parent of the Google Letter 7, Cynthia Ngewu, who's the mother of Christopher Pitt. Um, and I went, I stood at the memorial and I asked young people who were walking past it, do you know anything about these seven? What do you know about them? And no one seemed to know. And in some ways, I think words are more powerful than monuments of stone and granite because words tell the actual story. And, and I wish that more people would take the time and trouble to write the stories of what really happened because I think that young people today just have not not because of their own fault, but because that history is not being, first of all, written, and secondly, it's not being taught in the school curriculum, and particularly in Indigenous languages. And I do think that that's something that needs to be addressed. And lastly, Beverly, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? What I hope they take away is the importance of a free and serious press. And we see today the demise of, of serious newspapers. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous thing. You know, your social media is just not, um, is not, is not a good alternative. You need trained, serious, professional people who know what they're doing and who are dedicated to their work. And both Chris and Tony have faced very serious consequences and at times were in danger. Um, so I would hope that people would recognize the importance of a, of a serious free press. And secondly, I think it's really important to understand that these things really did take place. And that unless we address them and look at them and understand them, we will never be able to go forward into the future because there are still people to this day who deny what happened. And they deny that to me. I've been told in the last few weeks that you know that my story is a complete lie when in fact every single piece of evidence in the in in the book was taken directly from the the police records themselves so <laughs> it's really important to tell the stories and to hope that those stories go out to younger south africans so that we know our history and we understand what it was like we can't move forward until we've done that that was beverly ross moller speaking to criminal media's polity about hunting the seven